This video is brought to you by Captivating History. Rome, the paragon of Western civilization. When we think of ancient Rome, we conjure images of mighty emperors in gleaming armor, legions of soldiers standing in formation, and magnificent structures surrounded by awe-inspiring statues. Some remember ancient Rome as the epitome of arts and culture that sprung from the Roman Republic. Others recall the Emperor of Rome as the symbol of European unification under one banner. Over this vast stretch of time, charting the Republic and the Empire, things were quite different. In the later era, Rome was not the rightful subject of poetic hyperboles and statements of grandeur. It was a declining empire that romanticized its past glories and fetishized its ancestors' cultural and technological contributions. Since the two eras of ancient Roman supremacy are quite diverse and unique, it is important to understand the distinctions between the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. After the Punic Wars with ancient Carthage, the Mediterranean landscape shifted. The Roman Republic was established in 509 BCE and lasted until 27 BCE. It was the embodiment of the Greco-Roman values that laid the foundation of Western civilization. As Rome's influence grew, and it started to gain territories outside of Italy, the structure of the government remained unchanged. In 60 BCE, three powerful men, Julius Caesar, Marcus Crassus, and Pompey the Great formed an alliance. Crassus was killed in a war, and Julius and Pompey turned against each other. After emerging victorious, Julius declared himself dictator for life and was assassinated for it. In 27 BCE, his great-nephew, Octavian Caesar, named himself Augustus, becoming the first emperor of Rome. The transition from democracy to an imperial authority marked the birth of the Roman Empire and a steady abandonment of the principles that had paved the way for their success. I founded Rome, a city of bricks, and left it a city of marble, claimed Augustus, as told by the Roman historian Suetonius. Greco-Roman fusion of art, literature, politics, and law brought reason, beauty, and integrity to the ancient world of superstitions and unfounded beliefs. These principles have stayed relevant for Western and Eastern civilizations to this day. From the poets and artists of the High Renaissance to the philosophers of the Enlightenment, it has served as a formidable blueprint for major cultural movements. So, where did it all start? How did this spiritual and cultural transformation begin? The beginnings of Rome lay in both myth and history. Octavian Augustus hired several individuals, including Virgil, to create a national myth. The tale, and its many versions, has been covered or touched upon by many authors, including, but not limited to, Cicero, Ovid, and Livy. Cicero avoids talking about supernatural events. Ovid criticizes some inconsistencies and Livy offers the most detailed account of the tale. According to the story, the twins Romulus and Remus were born in a little kingdom called Alba Longa. Their mother, Rhea Silvia, a Vestal Virgin, claimed that the god Mars had raped her. Historians think that the supernatural invention was a convenient excuse to cover up a human affair. Rhea's father, Numitor, was expelled from the throne by his brother, Amulius. Threatened by the newborn boy's potential claim to rule, Amulius ordered their deaths, and they were left on the bank of the Tiber River. The god, Tiberinus, saved them, and a she-wolf fed them. Remember, this is part myth, part history. When they became adults, they joined sides with their grandfather against their uncle. After the death of their uncle and the restoration of their grandfather to the throne, they set off to build a city. In his poem, Fasti, Ovid writes, Remus saw six birds. Romulus, twelve in a row. They stuck to the pact and Romulus was granted the city. After a dispute over the city's location, Remus was killed by his brother and Romulus founded the city of Rome. People throughout history have contested the fable's veracity and rightly so. To some, it is the product of an active imagination. Others attempt to extract some nuggets of truth from it. The Romans elected four kings after Romulus, Numa Pompilius, Tullus Hostilius, Ancus Martius, and Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, and the sixth king, Servius Tullius, inherited the throne. Livy, or Titus Livius, the great Roman historian, 
states that Servius was responsible for the prosperity and development of the Roman Republic. The daughter of Servius conspired against her father with her husband, Lucius Tarquinius. Lucius usurped the throne and killed Servius. He ignored the Senate and ruled with an iron fist. His tyrannical and ruthless methods generated a backlash that saw the Romans revolt. They overthrew and banished him from the land. They also abolished the monarchy and gave birth to the Free Republic of Rome in 510 BCE. The period from 753 to 509 BCE is known as the Regal Period and is shrouded by legends, myths, and sometimes contrasting, unverifiable accounts. As res republica, or a public thing, Rome ushered in a new era. Instead of a monarchy, the people voted for consuls who would serve as central public officials of the Republic for a year. Although the exact timeline of this change is not known, Res Republica began sometime between 500 BCE and 300 BCE. During this period, new political ideas were introduced, civil liberties were emphasized, and a strong sense of Roman culture began to emerge. So what happened in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE that prompted such a profound change in the Roman way of life? Internal and external disputes troubled the Roman Republic. The internal dispute stemmed from the accrual of power and influence in the hands of a small group. This aristocratic group, known as the Patricians, drew the hatred of the rest, known as the Plebeians. However, this was not standard class warfare. The Patricians belonged to specific Roman families like the Claudii, Juli, and Corneli, and everyone excluded from the privilege of belonging to such families was a Plebeian. Therefore, Plebeians were not all poor people. There were also wealthy plebeians who wanted to be a part of the governmental bodies. In 494 BCE, the plebeians decided to go on strike. They refused to join the army or work until they were granted some sort of representation. Conquest was an important part of the Roman lifestyle. Without an army to defend its territories, Rome would have fallen into disrepair. When called for military duty, the people had to oblige. The patricians had no choice but to comply, so the people were given the right to form Concilium Plebis. This event is known as the First Secession of the Plebes. Until this point in time, the patricians interpreted the law orally, and there was no clear written document. Around 450 BCE, the Twelve Tables was composed, which became the foundation for ancient Roman law for centuries. It was far from a perfect document and reforms were needed soon after its implementation. The Twelve Tables introduced key concepts of justice, equality, and punishment in Roman jurisprudence and served to ease the tension between the two parties. Two more secessions followed, and by the 3rd century BCE, the plebeians greatly influenced the socio-political sphere. Rome also had two sides. One hosted the sophistication of the upper and middle classes, and the other favored political backstabbing populism, and the occasional murder. For civilized folk, the Romans appear to be quite barbaric and ruthless. This attribute manifested itself in their thirst for combat. Whereas the ancient Greeks made their fortune through maritime trade, the Romans made it by taking over foreign territories. Slaves were a major driving force in their economy. Their invasions produced prisoners of war, and they took advantage of their diversity, assigning educated slaves to teaching and domestic work and muscular slaves to heavy work. The Romans respected military achievements, and the easiest way to climb the social ladder was through the military. Honor, pride, and glory were important facets of their social order. People who could prove their mettle could improve their socioeconomic conditions, meaning Rome was a far less rigid society than some other social orders of ancient times. After military work, family was the most important thing as exemplified by the patricians. Males were often the head of the family and were responsible for all sorts of worldly affairs, whereas upper-class women were confined to their domestic roles as homemakers. Citizenship was typically awarded to those people whose parents were Roman citizens, but while women could be Roman citizens, they could not vote, and while patrician women could be highly educated, they rarely had the chance to exhibit their worth. Rome was in an almost constant state of war just like other states during this period. In the beginning, the Romans simply wanted to defend their borders to ensure political stability and maintain internal order in times of civil wars. 
They did not have any aspirations of world conquest, but after clashing with their neighboring tribes, such as the Etruscans, Samnites, and others within Italy, they started to gain momentum. When the Etruscans attacked Rome twice and failed, other Latin cities, inspired by the Roman effort, created the Latin League. Shortly after the Romans defeated the League in 338 BCE, the Latin cities became a part of the Roman system. In the 4th century BCE, the Gauls emerged as the new threat in the region. After a little back and forth, the Romans made massive military and technological leaps. They built massive walls to protect their city and restructured their army to defend against the Gallic onslaught. After successful defenses against the Gauls, they definitively defeated the Etruscans. They fought an Italian people known as the Samnites, when after Magna Graecia, which acquired its name because of the Greek settlers that inhabited the place in large numbers, and eventually gained control over most of Italy. As the Romans advanced through the lands, their supremacy over the Mediterranean did not go unnoticed. The Carthaginians in North Africa and the Egyptians were making friendly deals with the Roman Republic. Still, these relations spiraled out of control, and the Republic had to participate in the Punic Wars in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE. After they triumphed over Carthage, the Roman Republic ruled over Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, Spain, and North Africa. The Hellenistic world was the envy of the Mediterranean, but in military and political might, no one could match the Romans. After the Macedonian Wars, the Western world ushered in an era of unbridled brilliance when the two cultures came together. The Greeks had made tremendous strides in philosophy, and Socrates had brought ethics to its forefront. Plato carried the torch, especially with his academy, where Aristotle spent some time as a pupil. Greek was the popular choice for literature and philosophy, so the Greeks often served as an inspiration for Roman authors like Cicero, Lucretius, Seneca, and Aurelius. Greece the captive made her savage victor captive and brought the arts into rustic Latium, wrote the Roman poet Horace. The visceral impact of the Greek culture propelled Rome into the upper echelons of arts and civilization. The Republic, and later the Empire, reached its zenith in an age referred to as the Pax Romana. Nothing short of a miracle, although most Greco-Roman philosophers would take issue with the use of that word, the Greco-Roman world paved the way for Western civilization for centuries to come. To learn more about the Roman Republic, check out our book, The Roman Republic, a captivating guide to the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, SPQR, and Roman politicians such as Julius Caesar and Cicero. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.